to the Balinese, the island is the only actual place in the whole world. The rest is an illusion, which is good, bad, or indifferent, but it has no real validity. We, as foreigners, are looked on kindly. They have no word for foreigners, they just say tam or guess and so on. But we're just people, or not quite people, because we have no ancestors. We have no Balinese ancestors. Yeah, and I, I'm Bill, I'm Bill. Hey, my minu, ma. Miney, 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 miney. Yeah, my guitar. Yeah, then come on to a door door. Dodok di 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 sini. Dodok di 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 di. Dodok saya bilang dodok. You don't see newspapers often here, and I never listen to the wireless news and that kind of thing. Every now and then in conversation, I find there's another war here and there's another war there, or somebody's announced something, and it doesn't touch me very much. I just think, oh well. You know, they haven't learned yet. They were doing that in the days of the Bible. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they're stuck with it. But I'm not. I, I live in the, the present, um, which is my very, very pleasant present. <laughs> I'm looking for is my own life. I think an escapist is escaping from it. And I feel that I've found my life here. Doesn't mean I've found it forever. Formerly, I found it in Salon. The whole household is really a very peculiar sort of a community because everyone seems to be able to do something Children can play musical instruments, and gardeners can do this and that. If you want something done, there's always someone around who can do it. One can play the flute, and another one can uh, carve stones and be a tailor or something like that. <laughs> If I'd lived in another, another century, I think I would have liked the 14th century, really. I think that really would have suited me very well, you know. All the sort of good and evil in my nature would have been given full play. <laughs> One of the rather special members of the household is Ida Bagus Rai. Ida Bagus? Ah, now, look, 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 look,
painter, very well known since the late 1940s, I suppose, who's been working very modestly and very quietly, who came to work for me about you know, three years ago now, simply to paint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very shy, very, very modest personality, rather gnome-like, full of a crazy sort of little humor. He always thinks I'm such a complete idiot. When I go to watch him working and so on, he'll point out this or that in a picture, saying, this is a boat, and that is a fish, and that is a bird, and this is a tree, as though one didn't know. I don't know whether it's because he thinks I'm a complete ass, or because that's just what he feels like saying to me about the picture that he's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but that's the second thing we have to say. Yeah, yeah. Young permit, say, say, from Bali. Yeah, yeah. Samat Galan. The Balinese really think, well, they absolutely know that they know a great deal more about the meaning and the essence of things than we do. They just think that we don't know, and they know the mystery, and they're probably quite correct in thinking so. It's a life in which you can have a free expression of yourself. To live here without work, though, to be completely impossible, because we like living in the middle of a fruit salad or something. It's, it's altogether far too beautiful and agreeable, so you need this sort of iron or acid or something of, of your own work, whatever it is, writing or painting, and uh, to keep you occupied, to, to keep you from just sort of melting into the, the general rather deceptive sweetness of the island. I use the sort of paints, basically, that they used to use but in a very different way. And that astonishes them to see absolutely, completely different effects got with the same pigments. I draw very freely and use underpainting in tempers and big areas of splashed on color, then drawn into and painted into and overpainted and so on, instead of simply the direct painting on cloth or paper. It was their technique. My seriousness has always been in tremendous doubt, and perhaps quite rightly, because though I'm really a serious painter, I enjoy life and I like humor and I like wit, and I like the expression of all of those things. And that's a little bit out of the context of this century when people think that you've got to have a whacking bloody big tragedy to be serious at all. They forget, oh, they forget far too damn much. I don't like to be thought of as a person who, when he wishes to be serious, has to put in huge areas of black for sorrow and red for anger and yellow for joy. I'm not that kind of one at all. But I don't know whether my painting is good or not. I just believe it is myself, but I don't know. That's for somebody else to judge. Now or later, whatever it is. <laughs> My image of wisdom is a sort of an aging fat man 
in a very beautiful house by the sea with a beautiful garden and around him the things that he loves and admires and uh, actually it sounds terribly like me really um, <laughs> not that I'm particularly wise <laughs> carvings and things I collect here, quite beyond their aesthetic value or their rarity or what have you. They have a value to me in that they are leads into the mentality and the history of the nation and they give as much of an idea to me as reading a dozen books on the subject. And now the Balinese really know how much I like the really antique carvings, which I use quite often as models for my paintings. So practically any morning, four or five of these dagangs, the sellers of antiques, come along. Over the last few years, from amongst them, I've come to have certain favorites like this wicked ancient old man, Pak Sading, who sits and jokes and grins away, and Greta, who's one of the most intelligent and one of my best friends amongst the Balinese, who has an endless fund of stories, legends, etc., about the different dragon carvings and singers and Garudas and all that sort of thing. It's practically a daily custom. You have to keep them down a bit, actually, otherwise they crowd in you when you're having breakfast. Carvings of the deer fascinated me because they're used in ancestor shrines to which they pay homage, certain families, to a Brahman ancestor from the Mojapite period. But for my own visual delight in them, they're halfway between an effigy and a reality. They're very archaic and hierarchic, but they're tremendously alive at the same time. And they enter into my ideas about painting and become subject for painting a great deal because you can use them as simply images or for things that are really living that have effects on people. someone to talk to. After all, I've got 16 people working here, but I like to have people who, who know my own world outside Bali to talk to, even if we're only talking about things that are here. I'm very self-sufficient, really. I don't want communities of artists and things like that. Never, ever did. My friends are artists, of course, you know country and that country, but I like living here as I do live. Let's all talk about it now. And I like seeing people who know about my world, and I like them coming here, and we sit and we drink and talk, and half the time, it's, well, well, nearly all of the time, it's not about art and exchange of ideas, it's just about gossip, so-and-so's run off with such and such and, and, and all the rest of it. And if you've heard so-and-so's done something else. Well, I, I enjoy all that very, very much. And who is it going to restore? Me. I was 
you know, the foundations are still good. But I would say that the erosion has crept in. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't, even if it doesn't like he has an acid tongue, but it's a marvelous acid tongue. You, you know, you couldn't ask for a, a nicer acid tongue than Donald. That's the bird. Ah, Doctor. There he is. Good Doctor. Good Doctor. Well, yeah, well, I don't know. Look at you. Marvelous. I'm sorry, I came too late. Huh? Much too late. Much too late. Yeah. I've got, I suppose, ten tremendous friends I've made throughout my life. Some of them are friends, some of them are old lovers who are now friends. Then there's another layer. That would be 50 or 60 in that lot, and they're friends. And then there's... <laughs> another lot who are acquaintances, fairly close ones, and, and then there's the rest. Richard came here, and after he left, we had a little earthquake, and he drank too much here, I think. But he went and sat on the beach, and he communed with himself. He met this uh, layak, this ghost, and it was a reasonable one. And it explained absolutely everything to him. But he can't remember what it was. <laughs> he was too bad. <laughs> <bankrupt. laughs> when a person dies and has been cremated, his ashes are taken down and they're put in the sea at certain points. And received by the goddess. But the beaches, because perhaps of this, are thronged with ghosts, layaks, demons, this and that. The people don't really like the beach at night. Orang Sakti is a very black magical person who walks about alone at night, which means he's not afraid of ghosts, demons and layaks because he's really their friend and who has by magical means methods of changing his shape into a dog or a horse or a terrifying man. The idea of the ambiguousness of things. The tree is a tree only because at this moment it's feeling like being a tree. But you might come on it unexpectedly at some time and it's feeling like being something absolutely different. People sort of are liable to ask me, how long uh, will it be before Bali is completely spoiled? It's a question that infuriates me. And when you say anything to answer that, they say, you, know, you can't stop progress. Um, but by God, I can, sort of for a <laughs> short time at least, anyhow, where it's around near me. Because what they mean by progress is the loss of everything, or, or, or the loss of all of the things that, that made our own world marvelous, that we've just sort of had, it's all flown away, you know, belief and, uh, oh, you know, whole sort of, I suppose, quite ridiculous values uh, that have gone now. And they haven't been replaced, in my mind, by anything good, except conveniences, you know, plumbing, uh, which I approve of. Very few machines I like. I like I like cars, but I can't drive one. Uh, gramophone I approve of very much because I like music. Um, but with the rest of, uh, of of the things, we're left with a, a technology, and most of the things are not 
that I can see of any use at all. People can't do anything themselves, you know. I was, well, I can't. I, I can't play music. I can't do any of the things that one should be able to do as a human being to, to really entertain yourself. Say, if the, well, if the electric power fails, you're, you're, you're just left. Um, the Balinese are not. They're, they're uh, still living entirely creatively. They all, can all do things. They, they, they all know that the proper things that belong to their lives. We don't. We think we can get it by calling a taxi and going to a, a I don't know, putting money in a jukebox or something. one Balinese who went to America, went on to France, went on to Spain, went to North Africa, and when he came back from all of these views from skyscrapers, this, that, and the other, and what he really remembered as a most tremendous shock was seeing in a department store a huge counter of plastic legs with nylon stockings on them, and that really penetrated his mind with a sort of horror. I feel this sort of great change is coming from the West, but they'll be introduced tremendously by the Indonesians themselves. I want what they really know to prevail, because what they do know has been built out of this island, out of this climate, out of where the sun rises and how hot it is. Life of the village in the morning is really signalized by all of its sounds. And after a while, as you get more familiar with the place, you realize that these make a sound map of the community's activities. people who smoke. It's the older generation of chew betel nut daily as a habit, which is a stimulus which calms them or gives them energy and so on. Mm -hmm. 
wandering down any of the streets in any of the villages at any time of the day, you always see people moving around, and lots of them. But I think in a whole day, you would not see people strained and worried and hurrying and thinking they're late and bothered and confused. They take their time. They're going to do what they're going to do, and they have no great anxiety about it whatsoever.